So we divided further non-Hodgkin lymphomas in B and T cells based on the cells that are involved. So if there are the B lymphocytes or the T lymphocytes. More than 80, 85% are B cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And we further divide in indolent and aggressive based on the rate of uh, the tumor uh, growth of these cells. And basically the slow growing are the indolent and the fast growing and the aggressive and the follicular lymphoma is uh, the most common indolent non-Hodgkin B cell lymphoma accounting for about 20-22% of all new diagnoses. So the uh, gold standard for diagnosis, uh, for diagnosis of the follicular lymphoma is biopsy. We prefer to have an excisional biopsy uh, since we can get a better understanding of um, the architecture of the follicular lymphoma, which can further um, give us the possibility to grade the follicular lymphoma that goes from 1 to 3B. And this is important because the management is different. But if that is not the case, because the anatomic location of the lymph node is difficult to identify, we can also accept a core needle biopsy that gives a good idea. Um, usually these uh, kind of uh, lymphomas are diagnosed uh, um, for investigation for other other kind of uh, um, you know other kind of disease or other kind of situation of uh, routine screening for instance a mammogram um, and uh, uh, for this reason uh, you, the first step usually is done by a CT scan that can evaluate the different lymph nodes in the body um, nevertheless uh, we always want uh, a supplementary imaging with the PET scan, since the PET scan is a functional imaging that use uh, a contrast with glucose that makes uh, um, the cells that are hyperreactive more captating and so gives a higher signal and direct the decision of the doctor to biopsy a lymph node rather than another one. Um, besides than that, we also want to have course the blood work in order to evaluate the level of the hemoglobin, the WBC, the white blood cells, the platelets, because that would indicate, for instance, the involvement of the bone marrow. We want to see another marker that is the LDH that might suggest the aggressiveness. And we want also to have a viral screening in order to evaluate if a person might have, uh, uh, for instance, hepatitis B and C or HIV, which is important because uh, the doctor needs uh, to uh, further um, combine uh, some antiviral uh, medicine in order to avoid uh, hurting uh, the patients during a potential treatment. So we need to distinguish, uh, first of all, uh, grading and staging. What I mean is that uh, the grading of a follicular lymphoma is uh, the um, anatomic involvement of uh, the lymph nodes from uh, the tumor cells. So if we have uh, more or less of uh, 10 different uh, uh, cells with a different shape that might be more or less aggressive. And uh, this is important because while follicular lymphoma from 1 to 3A is treated in more indolent is believed to be indolent the follicular lymphoma 3b is instead thought to be more aggressive and close to diffuse large b cell lymphoma requiring then an immunochemotherapy to start with from the other side is very important as i mentioned the imaging so ct scan pet scan because this gives us the possibility to stage the passion meaning that to see how many different lymph nodes are involved in the body. We have usually as a reference the diaphragm, so we want to understand if it is above or below the diaphragm or both, because this again changes the management of the patients. So the treatment is based, first of all, on the staging, as I mentioned, and on the symptoms. So if we are in front of a stage one or two, that is called early stage, so involvement of one, one lymph node or one, um, only one area of the body, uh, the, the most typical treatment is a radiotherapy. And this is because, first of all, low rate of side effect. Second, because it can achieve in 90% of the cases the long-term remission and in 50% of, of the cases, even the cure. 
However, this might be not the case based on uh, the location again of the lymph node because uh, we don't want to risk to irradiate a vital organ or uh, to uh, damage a further tissue that cannot be repaired. So in that case, uh, we might use uh, an immunotherapy with monoclonal antibody against the CD20, which is a protein specifically expressed by B cells, so the tumor cells. Why, if we are in front of an advanced stage, so we, when we have more lymph nodes in the body, the decision is based, first of all, on symptoms of the patient, meaning that if the patient may experience fatigue, uh, weight loss, uh, night sweats, uh, or can have like uh, um, other additional components that are part of a criteria that is called GELF criteria, which is a standardized international criteria evaluating the size of uh, the lymph nodes. So if more than seven centimeters, or if three or more lymph nodes are more than three centimeters, or if the lymph nodes compress an organ, a vital organ, for instance, kidney, that might alter the kidney function or the, uh, the lung, so uh, the person cannot breathe well. Or if we have like cytopenia, meaning anemia, reduced level of the uh, white blood cells, reduced level of the platelets, all these conditions may drive and so suggest that we need to start treatment. Alternatively, if all of these conditions are not present, the attitude is to do what is called um, wait and watch, meaning that we uh, there was a, there were like two different uh, uh, clinical trials comparing uh, treat, treating the patients uh, upfront compared when needed so when needed when they have the symptoms and there was no difference in survival between uh, the two different methods so we prefer to avoid giving upfront potential toxicity uh, rather than give when is required because the most important things that a patient needs to understand, this is a chronic disease, meaning that it's not life-threatening. We need to identify treatment where required with a span of life that as now is more than 18 years in the media. So this is a very great timing for follicular lymphoma also because the research is improving further and further. So we want to make sure that patients will feel uh, supported because also the other point is Watch and waiting is not not doing anything. The patient is going to be checked every three to four months with blood test and potentially scan when required. And the doctor will check continuously if he will need any kind of treatment. This is the most important part that patient needs to understand. When we meet the, the criteria, Again, uh, at that point, we need to balance which kind of treatment we need to do. So there are different components. First of all, the tumor burden, meaning how much disease is present. If we have low tumor burden, so uh, not so much disease that is involving, but is symptomatic, we might decide just to go with a an monoclonal antibody, so that immunotherapy that I mentioned, that can target specifically the cells. And and is a treatment done weekly for four administration and can give until uh, um, around 75% of remission in uh, three years in the, the major part of the, um, the patient. Or alternative, if we have high tumor burden, so a lot of disease, if the, the PET scan shows that there is like this SUV that is the index of the PET scan that show how active is the disease that is superior usually to around 13, that might suggest a more aggressive disease, we, uh, or if there is additional cytopenia or um, a, a, symptom, a symptom that is usually um, strong and suggest a potential aggressive disease, we instead decided to go with immunochemotherapy 
And usually the immunochemotherapy is the combination of the immunotherapy that I mentioned before, the tuximab, with the chemotherapy that currently the best are either ARCHOP or um, BR, or rituximab and damastin. The difference basically is on also the side effects. If you want, bendamastin may give like um, uh, less uh, um, malotoxicity, so it can induce less uh, problems with uh, the blood cells and it doesn't give alopecia but from the flip side might give like a um, chronic lymphopenia that is not so advisable in a timing like a covid that we have and the uh, uh, CHOP is uh, very effective, particularly if a, a, an aggressive disease is a, a suspect, uh, since it is also the gold standard for uh, the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, that is the aggressive lymphoma that I mentioned before. So usually it's a discussion that the doctor uh, had with the patient and uh, is a, a combined decision between uh, the two persons involved in the management. Yeah, as I mentioned, this is a very exciting timing for uh, research in lymphoma. So we are uh, um, uh, at the beginning of understanding better uh, all uh, the landscape at the genetic and microenvironment level of follicular lymphoma. The most common uh, mutation in follicular lymphoma are chromatin modifier gene mutation. And specifically, the most successful example is EGH2. Last year has been approved an EGH2 inhibitor which is able to acquire an overall response rate of 69% in patients with mutation of these genes that reprogram the cells to become a neoplastic. But this uh, uh, inhibitor is also able to achieve around 35% uh, of response rate in patients that are wild type. This means that uh, um, this, this gene is, has a critical uh, uh, role in uh, organizing and making the cells um, respond in particular to a stimulus for uh, the cancer. CAR T cell has been just approved um, since uh, achieved 90% of response rate rate in follicular lymphoma, which is a huge success, though the caveat is always um, the side effects that should be balanced based on the situation of the patient. Currently, we have four different pitrekinase inhibitors that are approved by FDA. Again, the balance is the side effect, but the novelst one are very, very uh, tolerable compared to the first generation. And lenalidomide. Lenalidomide has been combined with rituximab in the regimen that is called R-square, since it's uh, rituximab reblinid and has been also very successful. And again, is just a pill that a patient can take and can tolerate and usually can give a, um, a, very, a very good response rate, though again, balancing the side effect associated with this uh, kind of treatment. The point is that uh, the, the variation that we might have is based also on the timing of relapse, meaning that there are some patients that relapse early on compared to another one. For instance, we have a way to think about relapse the 24 months from initial treatment that is called POD24. If a patient relapse within 24 months from the uh, first line therapy, this is meant to be more aggressive kind of disease compared if a patient relapse later on. So one of the most important part for patients that relapse so early might be to be enrolled in a clinical trial since these patients are unlikely to respond to the normal and common therapy that we have as now. But they might have more option and more possibility to respond to the novel treatment. So what is also important to understand is that despite being a role in a clinical trial, this is not just an experiment, but is trying to offer the best current treatment um, developed from the understanding of 
the lymphoma per se at the genomic and microenvironmental uh, point of view in patients that require the most. And uh, I would encourage everyone that may have uh, this kind of uh, relapse uh, to, uh, to ask their own doctor and uh, see which kind of uh, potential treatment are available because it's important uh, to handle uh, carefully this kind of situation. The other point is that if a relapse uh, patients might transform. So uh, some Sometimes uh, the relapse uh, may develop in, uh, in a grass lymphoma like diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and in this case, it uh, needs uh, to um, receive immunochemotherapy based also on the vessel line treatment because it depends if it was a, if the patient received a monoclonal antibody or an immunochemotherapy so the following therapy the second line depends exactly on the first line that received for the follicular lymphoma and so it's going to be an immunochemotherapy potential associated or not to bone marrow transplant based on also the age of the, uh, the patient and the fitness and the uh, uh, last one are patients that relapse uh, after a long time, that if they receive a rituximab, they might also receive again rituximab or may have and get the novel approved treatment that can uh, be offered to the different patients. So uh, currently, the, the first things that I would advise uh, to all uh, the follicular lymphoma patient, but uh, lymphoma patient in general, is uh, to get uh, a vaccination against the COVID CD19 because uh, it's very critical to build up an immune response as we can. The reason why I'm saying that is that in the moment in which this patient needs a treatment, and specifically the monoclonal antibody rituximab, rituximab target B cells, as I mentioned, but targets not only the tumor B cells, but target also normal B cells. So this means that the immune system is not able to build up an immune response after receiving rituximab for six to eight months so uh and this makes like the passion more susceptible to a worse form of covid19 and potentially death because again we uh we are in a condition where the immune response, uh, immune response is decreased compared to normal people so i would suggest and encourage uh, first of all uh, to try um, uh, to uh, protect themselves with a good vaccination and uh, to have a discussion with uh, their own doctors and uh, just try to get the treatment when at the time uh, arrives for symptoms and if that is the case uh, just follow all the advice of the doctors to try uh, to cover as, the, as much as they can uh, the health of their own patient. The, the main reason is what I mentioned, because uh, we are uh, uh, in front of a very exciting timing for research. We are uh, uncovering the mechanism of uh, this disease, and uh, we are just on the tip of the iceberg. We want to further understand more and more which are the focal gene, how we can uh, target them, and how we can provide the best precision medicine with uh, the highest rate of success and the lowest rate of side effects. So since uh, 10, 10, 20 years ago, we can see that the development has been uh, gigantic, I would say. So the more we understand, the more we study, the prolonged will be um, the survival and potentially the goal is to achieve the cure, as I would say. Absolutely. I found uh, the resources on the Lymphoma Risk Foundation, Foundation extremely helpful because it's very important to have uh, the knowledge of the disease and uh, the website, the webinar that are offered are able to educate the passion, educate the family. They are very helpful. There is like an app line that is able uh, to uh, talk, communicate. It's important for the passion to have somebody uh, to, uh, that can share their own feeling, that can support. So a support in this kind of journey is focal because this is a marathon. So we need to have a long run uh, plan for uh, making sure that the passion will live without uh, any psychological um, repercussion on their own life. So it's uh, absolutely important that they will connect with LRF through helpline, uh, through all uh, these uh, um, kind of events that are offered, the different disease focus seminar is very important for them to reach out to you guys. 
Um, the way in which uh, the LRF uh, uh, has helped at least uh, many of my passion is uh, because it's uh, the, the first step for a passion to reach out to people and understand better what is a lymphoma. So um, before arriving to an oncologist, usually there are several steps. And before arriving to the steps, uh, receiving that diagnosis, uh, patients want to understand in a lay language what is going on, what they have to expect, what they have to do who they have to contact because many many times they really don't know where to start who to contact and it's very important so I found that many of my patients were grateful to LRF just because uh, um, they help going through the right step uh, to arrive uh, the, the, you know, the right place, the right people that can handle the disease. And uh, I think that is uh, very important as the diagnosis and also in the long run, because again, there is a support group. So staying with people that are going through the same path is very important because you understand, you help each other, you support each other so i believe that is a, a extremely important tools that everyone should use